Hi everyone, I'm Professor McBain. Welcome back to Chem 100 and welcome back to our series on nuclear power and nuclear war. In this video, we are going to be talking about nuclear weapons, finally. There are four nuclear uh, detonations that we're going to be focusing on for this course. So find out more. Welcome to our final lecture video about nuclear chemistry. When we left off, we had just discussed accidental explosions that occurred as a result of nuclear reactions taking place. This time we're going to discuss the use of radioactive materials to blow things up on purpose in nuclear weapons. Before we start, yes, the slide is a different theme than what you've seen in the last two videos, and probably at this point, the microphone and my voice sound different as well. So admittedly, this is an older video recording, but it is the absolute best take that I've ever done on this topic. So hope you enjoy. All right, so now let's talk about having nuclear reactions spiral out of control on purpose. Let's talk about nuclear weapons, okay? So um, we saw earlier that fission can be started by a neutron, but we also see here that three more neutrons are generated as a result of the fission of uranium, okay? And so because even more neutrons are produced as products, it's possible for a chain reaction of nuclear fission to take place as long as you have enough uranium-235 present to sustain that chain reaction, okay? So if you have what we call a critical mass of uranium-235, which is about 33 pounds of that isotope, you have enough fuel to sustain a chain reaction for a long time and basically cause all of it to go through fission. And if that mass can be held together long enough for them all to be subjected to um, neutron bombardment, then of course you can make it go very fast and it can result in a very large explosion. Okay, so that's the basis of nuclear weapons that were created in the 40s. So here's a schematic of Little Boy, which was the bomb which was dropped on Hiroshima, okay? Um, its explosive power was equal to 13 to 16 kilotons of TNT. That's just like the, the unit that they started measuring explosive power in was a certain mass of TNT, okay? Um, and that was due to there being 140 pounds of uranium in this bomb, okay? So again, like we talked about earlier in class today, it requires much, a much smaller mass of uranium to get the same explosive power as you would of TNT. Okay? So um, what they did was they had a hollow uranium bullet back here that upon dropping, there's a small conventional explosive, like just a little pellet of TNT. Um, it's a contact, like an, a pressure explosive there. So as, as soon as the conventional explosive is subject to a certain amount of force, then it forces the hollow uranium bullet here to be propelled forward to the second mass of uranium, okay? So before you drop the bomb, you've got two small masses of uranium, okay? And they're small enough that they're not going to undergo fission on their own, but as soon as you combine them with force in this way, they will start to readily undergo fission, okay? Um, so I'm sure that you've heard about this in your history classes, but Upon this bomb dropping on, on Hiroshima, 90% um, of the town was wiped out in seconds, and 80,000 people were killed in that initial blast. There were a total of 100,000 deaths due to radiation poisoning, acute radiation poisoning, over the next few days. And people who viewed the blast from far away, like far enough away that they wouldn't be injured by the radiation, if you looked at this blast with the naked eye, you were blinded. Isn't that crazy? You can go blind from just looking at the intensity of the flash. That's how much energy is released. So for those of you that have ever seen, oh gosh, what was it? There was Terminator, there was True Lies. Um, you remember in True Lies, almost at the end, they like hide their eyes while they're kissing and there's this flash over in the Florida Keys from a nuclear bomb being detonated. Um, yeah, so that's why they shield their eyes. Anyway.
So Fat Man was the second bomb and that was dropped on Nagasaki. So this bomb had a slightly more complicated uh, design, okay? Your takeaway here should be that plutonium was used instead of uranium, but plutonium is another radioactive element that if you use the right isotope, then it can readily undergo fission, much in the same way that uranium does, okay? So its explosive power was 21 kilotons of TNT from a mere 14 pounds of plutonium, right? So on this last one, you had less explosive power from more mass of uranium. This time you have more explosive power from a smaller mass of plutonium, okay? Um, yep, so plutonium was used instead. The explosion was more powerful. Uh, but the deal was that the they didn't drop the bomb exactly on Nagasaki. They they kind of missed their mark with the with the drop. And so there were fewer casualties than were expected. Okay, so there should have been more people that died from this bomb, but because they missed their mark, um, a lot of the force of this bomb was basically wasted on the uh, on the surrounding areas. At least that's how the military saw it at the time. So only 40,000 people died instantly, uh, but there would have been many, many more who would have died if the bomb had actually been uh, deployed on its mark. And then 60 to 80,000 people have suffered long-term fatalities and effects from this bomb. So those are conventional uranium bombs, uranium and plutonium bombs, okay? Um, after the 1940s, the 1950s came about and folks started getting a little bit more creative with how we use nuclear force to make a bomb, okay? So instead, this is where the hydrogen bombs started being designed, okay? So a bit of fission from either uranium-235 or plutonium-239 um, initiates the explosion and heats things up in the... Um, basically in the, in the bombshell. Um, there's high, expo high explosive lenses, basically it like helps amplify the explosion from the uranium or the plutonium, okay? Um, and then it basically heats everything up really, really high, and it triggers a second stage reaction of fusion, which has much more power as we talked about earlier in class, okay? It helps everything reach that 40 million degree temperature so that fusion with uh, lithium or fusion with hydrogen can occur. So the fusion reaction that occurs in the second stage process is what releases all of the energy um, that you get out and what we consider to be like the explosion of the bomb. Okay. The morning of March 1st, 1954 came like just any other to the Marshall Islands of the Pacific Ocean. The residents quietly went about their business. Meanwhile, the crew of the Japanese fishing boat, Lucky Dragon 5, had left port and now were tuna fishing 100 miles to the east of a set of Marshall Islands named the Bikini Atoll. Bikini Atoll had been taken over by the U.S. military in 1946. As part of a nuclear testing program, the residents were relocated and a base built at the site. Early on the morning of March 1st, technicians were preparing for another weapons test coded Castle Bravo. Scientific instruments were ready. Aircraft were prepared to take air samples. Observation towers were opened and their high-speed cameras were loaded. Castle Bravo was the first hydrogen bomb small enough to be carried by an aircraft. Scientists had calculated that the bomb, fueled with a lithium-6 isotope, would create about a 6 megaton explosion. Because lithium-6 was hard to separate from lithium-7, however, the bomb actually had more lithium-7 than 6. This didn't worry the scientists because their calculations showed that the lithium-7 would be inert. The base was evacuated, and at 6.45 a.m., the firing crew, safe in their bunker, pushed the button.
The enormous heat of the detonation instantly scorched everything it could burn. A few seconds later, a tremendous shock wave, traveling at the speed of sound, arrived, tearing trees and buildings apart. The crew of the Lucky Dragon was amazed when suddenly a second sunrise appeared in the western sky. Scientists monitoring the test quickly realized that something was wrong. The Lithium 7 hadn't been inert. The explosion wasn't 6 megatons, but 15, 250% of the expected size. Because of the miscalculation, the fallout from Castle Bravo test was far more than anticipated. The firing team was trapped in their bunker by high radiation. Two populated atolls to the east were belatedly evacuated. Not expecting to have to move people, they was forced to press destroyers, originally sent for security reasons, into service. The islanders suffered many health problems for decades, including birth defects. The crew of the Lucky Dragon touched fallout material with their bare hands and suffered nausea, headaches, and burns. Within six months, the ship's radio man had died of radiation poisoning, the first fatality of Castle Bravo. The base near the test site was ruined, and many of the instruments designed to measure the explosion were destroyed. The miscalculation of Castle Bravo was the biggest nuclear contamination accident in the history of the United States. The fallout was detected as far away as Australia, India, Japan, and North America. What happened at Castle Bravo led to an international call for a ban on the atmospheric testing of thermonuclear devices, all because of a miscalculation. was definitely the largest detonation ever made by the USA. So the largest test detonation in history was made by the Soviet Union, the USSR. This occurred in October of 1961, and it yielded 50 to 57 megatons of TNT, basically. That was the magnitude of this explosion, okay? So to give you an idea of what we're looking at here, right? All these numbers are all these numbers can be a little bit obscure without a reference scale. So let's take a look at this handy little um, this little GIF GIF, however you want to pronounce it, from Gizmodo. Okay, so let's let it recycle again. So here's the size of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Castle Bravo was basically twice the height of Mount Everest. Okay, so if that's just the size of the mushroom cloud, you can imagine that the force scales with that at least just as much, if not even more than that, okay? So this blast wave, you know, the, the mushroom cloud itself was huge. It was even dangerous for the people who dropped this bomb. Um, they flew as fast as they can away from the bomb site, from the drop site. Um, and yet it still shook the plane and, and injured the people, okay? Um, so right here is where the test bomb was dropped, Zemlia, okay? Which you don't usually see on most maps of Europe. Um, and the blast wave was so strong that it shook windows out of their window frames as far away as Norway and Finland. This island is not populated. It's, at the time, it was purposefully designated as like weapons test areas for the USSR. But you can imagine that if that bomb was dropped somewhere that people lived, it would just be instant death and chaos, right? It produced third degree burns in people from 62 miles away. And the mushroom cloud itself was 40 miles high, which is eight times higher than Mount Everest. So take home, the Tsar Bomba was the largest detonation in the world, and it was done by the USSR, okay? The largest detonation done by the United States was Castle Bravo. 
Um, and overall, nuclear weapons are pretty scary, and it's a darn good thing that uh, the Cold War stopped and that we stopped trying to accumulate more and more nuclear weapons because they're very dangerous, and they absolutely will lead to um, immediate deaths and then long-term illnesses that are just bad news for the human population.